Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? This is Lindsay Lerner, and you're listening to The Cost of the Status Quo. More people than ever are questioning why they do what they do and forging their own path. And on this show, I sit down with these entrepreneurs, trailblazers, creatives, and overall awesome beings to discuss the ideas, the opportunities, and the overall tips and tricks they're using so that the rest of us can do the same. This is The Cost of the Status Quo. Today, we're here with Amy Chin, the proud mother of two beautiful daughters, a born and bred New Yorker, and a true believer in the healing powers of CBD. Can you think of a source or two of stress? How do you typically navigate it? Amy believes that we often need a more holistic approach to heal and has found that through CBD. She started her company, Calm Better Days, to spread the joy of CBD and dispel the inaccurate information that is frequently spread. Today, Amy is here to share her tips, tricks, and habits that she's picked up along the way while navigating the waves of life. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. It would mean the world to me if you subscribed, rated, and reviewed this. Welcome, Amy. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. Hi, Lindsay. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Let's take it back all the way. Where in the world did you grow up? Well, I grew up here in New York, born and raised, like you said. And where in New York specifically? I grew up in Chinatown. And now I live in Lower East Side, so I didn't move very far. I'm a downtown girl. I probably will be (laughs) forever. Amazing. And when you were when you were growing up, what was that like? Was there any idea of this, you know, this notion of what do you want to be when you grow up? I thought I wanted to be a lawyer at one point. And that was probably because my parents wanted me to be one, either that or a doctor. I did not do either. (laughs) I did product development. I worked at Federated and then for apparel and then went into restaurant management for another career. And then it was then that I had kids discovered or rather diagnosed with anxiety and postpartum depression. And that's how I got into plant medicine. Was there a specific moment that you decided to turn your personal experience and passion, obviously, into an actual business? So the funny thing is, I have been a longtime THC consumer. And then when I was diagnosed with anxiety and postpartum depression, which was about eight, nine years ago, I actually had to get my medical card to get the non-euphoric cannabis to manage my anxiety and depression. Once I tried the CBD, that's when I was like, wow, I I need to look more into this plant because I knew this plant was amazing, but I didn't know how amazing. And to discover both sides of it, the euphoric and non-euphoric, I just started diving deeper into it. And I knew that I wanted to work with the plant and I was trying to figure out how. So as I looked into it more and more, started learning more, the farm bill was passed. And the farm bill meant that CBD was federally legal. So we started seeing CBD dispensary stores everywhere. And that was when I was like, well, first, now that we see it everywhere, right? Amazon, gas stations, people were giving it a try. However, the problem I saw was that people were giving it a try, but they didn't know how much to take, what they were taking, what was a quality product. And because they didn't know that, when they did give it a try, it didn't work. And then they said, well, this stuff is snake oil. It doesn't work, right? So I saw that void and I was like, well, I'm going to fix that. And that's when Calm Better Days was born. I decided I was going to help those who are new to plant medicine understand how to consume, understand the nuance of different delivery methods how to find your dose, how does it even work in your body, right? These are basics one should know before they start their journey with plant medicine. And so not only do I do teach the basics, but I also customize their treatments. So when people come to me and say, I've got sleep issues, pain, and anxiety, I help them find the right products to address their issues. And let's just for listeners who may not be familiar or maybe haven't gone as deep as you or I have into researching or anything like that, could let's take a step back and define some of the terms for listeners, starting with maybe cannabis, CBD, 
THC and then the overall more holistic view of plant medicine, since I think that's something that's starting to come more and more into the vernacular of the society in general. <laughs> and so really just starting from from ground zero of what are the actual actual things that we're discussing and, and the differences, most importantly. In the cannabis plant, there are over 100 different cannabinoids. So cannabinoids are THC, CBD, CBN, CBG. There are a lot more, but those right now are the most common. The most common are THC, which gives you that high, and CBD that does not give you that high. And that's really important to know because I know a lot of people always are concerned. They're like, oh, I don't want to be high, you know, and I'm like, that's okay. That's what CBD is for. And it's important to understand that every cannabinoid has their own therapeutic uh, purpose. So just like CBD, you don't get high. THC, you do get high. However, they both can be used to treat pain, stress. What I'm trying to teach people is that there is a time and place for every product. So we want to think about what we want to address, our intention, right? And then the time and place. So for example, if someone has severe pain and they need to go to work, they may not want to be high, which is totally understandable, but still want to treat their pain. And that's where CBG comes in and you can combine it with CBD to treat that pain. And then they're done with work. They come home, they're not working anymore, and sometimes they still want to treat that pain, but now they can relax, and you can have that CBG in combination with THC to treat that pain. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's just important for people to understand the differences between all of the different options that are out there. And I think to your point, a lot of the misconceptions that are out there and a lot of the stereotypes that a lot of those more, you know, quote unquote, negative views of it are the reason why so many people may have been against it previously and are now starting to to come around little by little. Absolutely. It's, it's a matter of finding the right product for you, whether that's with the high, without the high, and during different parts of your day. Yeah, absolutely. And for you, I think that that ties into another question that I would have, which is what to you is mindful consumption of cannabis? So I really believe in listening to our body. Our body tells us what we need, right? And that goes into our dose, which I believe our dose mimics the rhythm of our life. And I think that sometimes we're, we just kind of go through the motions and we don't stop to think, okay, what is going on right now? We know stress are external factors out of our control. And when things are hectic and, you know, maybe a life-changing event is happening, it is okay to increase your dose. Just like if I am making great lifestyle choices in terms of getting adequate sleep, eating healthy, and, you know, practicing my spirituality, and probably managing my stress better with all of that, right, then I also can decrease my dose. And it also ties into, mindful consumption to me also ties into how my day is, knowing what I need to address. So for me, with anxiety, my mornings are always gloomy. <laughs> I wake up with that dark cloud and it's saying, hey, welcome to another great day. <laughs> so, and knowing how my anxiety mind works, my mind is everywhere. My running task is going and then I'm feeling overwhelmed and then paralyzed and then I'm unable to focus and be productive. So for me, I take my CBD right when I wake up because I need to set the tone for for the day. I want to start off grounded and to really address those anxiety symptoms. So I'll probably redose two to three times a day because tinctures last for about four hours to get me through the workday. 
And then depending how my night goes, if I have to do more work or, you know, my work is done, my kids are in bed, then that's when I will go for my serious relaxation and use THC. And sometimes that really helps me reset because sometimes when I'm going through my production mode, right, I notice that I'm not giving my mind the time and space for those thoughts to come out because I'm always busy running, running, doing this, doing that, checking everything off my list. And so when I actually sit down and pause, I can hear my thoughts clearly and sometimes find answers to things or questions I've been like thinking about, but couldn't find an answer to. And it almost seems like the answers are there, but they're out of the box. And I just allowed it to come out and realize, wow, I had the answer all along. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think, at least in my experience anyway, it feels like we really haven't been listening to our bodies, especially in the United States, especially in New York City of all places. Oh, yes. Yeah. It, it really, yeah. yeah, it really feels like we haven't haven't listened to our bodies in so long. And it seems like it's almost a new practice, at least in my experience, being able to dive into whether it's meditation or yoga or just just pausing to your point and allowing for that space. And with this new practice in mind, is that part of the reason why there's so much fear, do you think, around cannabis products? Uh, I don't think so. I Well, I think a lot of people from what I hear is the fear that they'll be addicted. And I do understand that some people are also consuming in the wrong way. They may be consuming to numb the problems instead of addressing it, which is a very easy slope. I get that. What's that difference for you? How would you how would you define either of those? Because there is, I've, and I've experienced too. There's the escape, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> and and then there is the, I would say, the enhancing of your lived experience and being able to navigate through whatever it is that's transpiring. So for me, I do think that once in a while we're allowed to escape. Right, there are days when you know what I just don't want to think about anything. Right. And I think that's allowed. Sometimes we're so busy doing thinking that we just need to veg out. Um, so I would say for me, as long as you know that you're giving yourself time and grace to sometimes just be, that's okay. But if we're doing it all the time and we're not addressing any issues in our life and happen to find ourselves in the same situation again and again, then yes, we are totally not being mindful about our consumption. Consumption. Um, so I would say that's the difference. And I would say also that cannabis is not addictive. And at the same time, I understand there are addictive personalities, which can be, you will be addicted to anything. Uh, doom scrolling on Instagram. Um, video games, coffee, these are all things we can be addicted to. <laughs> so we have to, you know, be mindful of that too. And for you, what is that intersection of parenting and cannabis look like? I think that's another thing that I've heard that heard of, I've heard a lot of from friends, acquaintances, doom scrolling on the internet, whether it's folks in cannabis or it's folks in other psychedelics or other plant medicines, that navigating that road and that personal journey and going through those steps to explore while being a parent, that's a totally different, <laughs> totally different experience, a totally different layer. And to your point earlier of, okay, you know, parenting is done, the kids are in bed, and now it's time where I can continue to take care of myself. And, and how do you navigate that? So I definitely speak to my kids about it. They are 
they also hear me probably on the phone or when I'm in my meetings and they hear CBD often. So I have talked to them about it because I want them to know what it is. Part of destigmatizing it is talking to your kids about it, just like you would talk to them about alcohol, sex. And I refer to CBD, THC, all as plant medicine, all as cannabis. There was a time when New York was not legal. I only used the word plant medicine and CBD because I did not want child services, CPS, or um, to be called, right? But now that it is legal, I do use the word cannabis. And I let them know that this is something adults, when you're an adult, you can think about if it's right for you. But I talk about how it's mommy's medicine and that it helps me be a better person. I do use a vaporizer, so they may they will see me using a vaporizer. And they know that it's mommy's stuff not to be touched by them. And I have a closet that I put everything in a way, a way where it's locked. Totally. And could you touch on a bit of brief history around the legality of cannabis products in, in general, and perhaps even dig a little bit deeper into why things have played out how they have? Well, there's a whole war on drugs. It started off there, which was really to incarcerate brown and black people. And so, and of course, now you have the big companies trying to pharmaceuticalize the whole industry. And in New York, hopefully they will write the regulations so that they are supporting social equity applicants first. CBD is now federally legal. And I think the concern with kids is mainly THC because we don't know the um, the effects of THC on the undeveloped brain. And our brain is not fully developed until age 25. So even when we're consuming CBD, we want to use broad spectrum or an isolate CBD where there is no THC at all. And even because CBD full spectrum has 0.3% THC. So... That is a concern there. Although I do know some parents whose kids are consuming CBD for autism, other, you know, epilepsy. So sometimes we have to really think about the benefits. Even moms with depression, we have to weigh the benefits. Is it better to be on a natural plant medicine? or be on prescription drugs that just kind of numb you out, or maybe some other side effect. Or if we don't use anything and we have suicidal tendencies, right? So we have to really be conscious and weigh what is the best choice for us, whether that is legal or not legal, and just to keep that in mind. Because just because something is legal doesn't mean it's right. So we really have to make our best judgment on that. And part of your business with Calm Better Days is offering consultations. What does that look like? And if people are interested, where could they start? Right. So consultations, they can book it right on my website. And when they book this consultation, which is free, we go over how CBD cannabis works in our body. Because I believe that once you understand that, that kind of demystifies it. And then it makes sense. Because when we see CBD, right, or cannabis, we see how it can be used for sleep, pain, anxiety, Parkinson's, like everything under the sun, right? And you're like, how could this one thing, how can this one plant address so many issues? But it can. So I explain that so people understand. Once they understand that, they're kind of more open to it. And then I walk them through the different delivery methods, their activation times, how long will it last for? And this is like tinctures versus vaporizer versus edibles, suppositories, right? And then we talk about how to find your dose. And and these are the basics that anyone should know. 
before they start their journey. And it's no different than when we go to a doctor and the doctor's like, well, you, we're going to put you on some antidepressants, try this, let's just say 30 milligrams, come back in a month, let's see how it works. And you come back to the doctor, you say, you know what, I had these side effects. He either writes you another drug or lowers your dose or increases it. And with plant medicine, it's no different, except I'm trying to empower them to learn to read what their body is saying and to adjust their medication appropriately. And then at the end of the consultation, we go over the products that are best for their situation. And then they can buy it off of my e-commerce website. I carry about 15 different brands with a focus on small farmed, women-owned, BIPOC-owned brands. I don't have time to always give the history on the war on drugs. <laughs> so I try to lead them toward conscious consumerism by supporting great brands, brands that have been marginalized in this industry, ethical, great brands with quality products. And I look at their certificate of analysis of every product. And I usually try out the product for a month before I carry it because I want to make sure it's safe. I want to make sure it works, what my experience is with it. And for you going through this whole process, it's been you know nearly a decade now of all of the research and the experimentation and your personal lived experience. Are there any, I don't know, is it a school? Are they certifications? Is this more so still underground knowledge that's passed amongst a different community, what what is that like? And what are what are the quote unquote qualifications for you to be able to be doing this work? Right. So there actually are a lot of schools right now popping up everywhere. I did get my certification with Dr. Mary Clifton, the cannabinoid protocol program, and also from Green Flower. So And like I said, it doesn't stop. So even though I have that background, you know, there's new stuff coming up every day. So I I keep up with that, the current news. But definitely a good place to start is by getting a certification. And even Oaksterdam University, there are so many. And most of them are online too. So you can definitely, anyone interested, it is a good time to get into it. Yeah. And with all of these different updates that are happening, I mean, obviously this plant has been around, you tell me. (laughs) Since um, the oldest plant was found in, I think, 2500 BC in Southeast China. It was buried in the tombs. (laughs) Yeah. It was buried in the tombs with them. Um, Yeah. Yes. And is is the cannabis plant, is that something I'm not familiar and I don't know what your familiarity with uh, with like Chinese herbalism is, if any. Was that something, I mean, growing up in Chinatown in a you know Chinese American family, was that ever something that was discussed? Was this like a seed that was planted, you know, for baby Amy or complete opposite? Complete opposite. <laughs> it- you did say doctors and lawyers. So. <laughs> yeah, they, my parents were completely against it. I remember one time they found it in my bag or somewhere. I don't oh. know. <laughs> and how old were you? I was early 20s. Um, okay. And they freaked out. And of course I said, no, it's my friends. <laughs> that, that never works. But um, um. But I was over 21, so. Sure. (laughs) Um, But they were, I don't know how or when, because it was part of original medicine. I don't know when it became stigmatized, if that was Western influence or, or how that came about. It was definitely not, not under my parents' household, uh, something that we could dabble in. Is that something that, I mean, do they have any opinions now? Well, my mom was in the hospital during COVID for pneumonia. And at that moment, 
there was slight dementia showing. It also could be because at that time she couldn't have visitors. So she kind of thought she was being locked up in a mental ward, not a hospital. And I think it was also probably, you know, you, you're waking up discombobulated, not knowing anyone familiar, not knowing what's going on, also the language barrier. So when I was able to visit her, she didn't know what was going on. And I gave her some CBD. I snuck it in and um, gave her some and, you know, just continued talking to her. And finally, she kind of like woke up and was like understanding what I was telling her. And that kind of helped. And I think ever since then, she's been a little bit more open about it. And I give her a bottle and I tell her to take some every day. Right. So I don't know if she really is, even though I ask her, she says yes. But when it's chocolate, she'll take it easily. So I think it's going to take some time, but they're turning around. So that's positive. How do you navigate entrepreneurship and the uncertainty of entrepreneurship, especially in in such a new industry that this is obviously there's the uncertainty of entrepreneurship and business ownership in general then there's the uncertainty of being in a you know being on the frontier of this new industry and then on top you know that's hard enough <laughs> never mind you know living in 2022 in the United States in New York <laughs> New York City and that pressure and then on top of that having you know such meaningful and close family members be skeptical of the work. What is that like for you? And other than obviously the CBD practices that you've explained to us so far, do you have any other habits or tactics that you use? It's definitely an absolutely challenging, super challenging, and also sometimes very lonely road. I have learned to surround myself with people in my tribe people who are also in plant medicine, people who are also into mental health. And I surround myself with good people to, to carry on because every day is a roller coaster. And I myself, aware of my own mental health issues, know that there are days that are really bad and there are days that are like, I can do this. <laughs> so... It's definitely challenging, but I'm going to keep on going and and continue to fight and educate those on plant medicine. And for me, I feel like it goes hand in hand because mental health is also not spoke about a lot in my culture. So I feel like I'm fighting for the plant. I'm fighting for mental health, for us to be more aware of it. Because if we're not aware of these things, there's no way we can ever address it. So having the conversation first is the utmost importance. And also normalizing moms consuming the plant. I've talked a lot about the stigma, especially around mental health, to your point. And it's been a recurring theme of a lot of the folks who've been on the show. So it's interesting hearing you know, your Chinese American perspective. And we did an interview with Britt Rowe of Hella Awkward, and she had the same experience coming from a Black American family as well. And so there's all of these different things. And it's like, man, (laughs) no wonder why, you know, we're at where we're at. And so do you think that there's any, anything that listeners may be able to do or conversations that may be able to be had now to continue to break those break those cycles, break the chains in a sense, and also continue to disrupt, you know, not to be on the nose, but to disrupt the status quo of how everything is that we're currently navigating right now. Definitely be open, open to a conversation, open to experimenting, open to change. I think it begins there because we've been conditioned so hard It's hard to even realize when we've been conditioned, we're starting to break away from that. But it begins with a conversation 
and just trying to understand what things really are and where our thoughts may have come from. Like all that conditioning, like sometimes I think about it, like mental health, like how did, how did I not know? Right. And it's because I was taught not to even really talk about my feelings. So when you are raised not talking about your feelings, you grow up not knowing how you even feel because I've been, you know, you've been taught, no, no, everything's good. Just keep on going to the point of breaking. That's why I never knew I had anxiety or depression. I thought it was just something, oh, those are common feelings. We just, we just keep on going. And I was so thankful to be diagnosed because once it was diagnosed and I was like, that's what that is. And then seeing the physical symptoms, the mental symptoms. And then when I saw that, I was like, oh my, I had that way longer than when it was diagnosed, right? Even before becoming a mom. But now that I know what it is, I can manage it. I can find tools and use different modalities to heal myself. And that's why it's so important to just have the conversation because the more we talk about anything, the more we learn about it, the more it changes our thought process about how we feel about certain things or understand where it came from. And that's how we learn to slowly disrupt, right? By being more informed, understanding the origins of certain things, whether it's the plan or a societal norm. I mean, is it really a societal norm or is it just being pushed down on us, right? <laughs> it's a long way down the open road, but I've got my shoes tied on tight. No fear in my eyes. I know. Were your parents from New York as well? They came in 1966 from Hong Kong and China. And how old were they when they came here? I think in their mid 20s. And were they here, were they working? Did they also have businesses? Were they doctors and lawyers like they wanted you to be? (laughs) Uh, No, they came, I think my grandfather came first, then my dad. And so they were working in restaurants. I grew up in working for my parents in a takeout restaurant, which was very common. Yeah. What was that like? (laughs) Did that like give you your entrepreneurial... (laughs) Spirit? (laughs) I don't know. I would say that, well, I had to work after school. So I would say it was sixth grade. I started working after school, which I hated because I wanted to go out and play like all the other kids. And every day I would go to my parents' restaurant and I would work, which I think all that time together and they were really strict on me made me just rebel more. And didn't help my case at all. No. I got to eat whatever I wanted. And I I love spare ribs. Yeah. (laughs) Hey, there you go. And hopefully that, you know, they give you a discount. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) That's a win. Yeah. And I, and I do appreciate everything that they have gone through and done for me. And at the same time, I also understand the world changes and it's time to break certain cycles. Like I, try to talk to my kids about feelings and, you know, communicate. I'm working on that. (laughs) Right. Hey, that's a work in progress for sure. I understand that. Do you, when you've touched on it a couple of times, when you're talking about the ability to be open-minded, is that something that you've trained yourself to do in a more conscious way? Or are there a series of steps or perhaps questions that you ask yourself to be able to be in that space rather than that knee-jerk reaction of, no, I'm good. I don't want to change. I don't want to, I don't want to think about that. I think hmm, that's a hard one. I think it's a combination of just being open to listening with a little bit of research myself and then finding resources that I trust. And I think sometimes for people, maybe it's just when you're finding unhappiness in your life and you're looking for something more, then you start deep diving. I think there are some people who 
if they don't reach that point, maybe, and they're kind of like, well, everything's kind of good. I can see that they may not find the need for that. Definitely. And is that headspace something that you take you know, outside of work as well, whether it's in learning new things, navigating your family, kids? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Because I want to, I, I definitely want to break the cycle and I definitely want to have a happier, healthier lifestyle. And I want that for my kids as well. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Oh, me too. <laughs> and, and to circle back to Calm Better Days, why is it important to you to support other women and other you know, BIPOC-owned businesses? Well, they've been one marginalized in the community, right? So I definitely want to support BIPOC-owned women. We just have it so hard. Yes, everywhere, right? In terms of we're usually the ones holding everything together. Um, And I'm speaking as moms, but I feel that women normally take that nurturing role. And even in the workplace, we have a bad deal, right? We're paid less. Now they're trying to take away our abortion rights. I mean, it's our body. And in the industry as well, there has been a drop in women in the industry. And this is a female plant. I also believe we fight for equality. We fight for things that to me just seems logical and right instead of trying to nickel and dime to the point where it might not be a quality product anymore. The whole, just like how the big pharmas are pharmaceuticalizing, trying to pharmaceuticalize the industry. I want to support brands that are really doing it right. And of course, I'm going to support women. (laughs) Hell yeah. Hell Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. That was going to be one of my last questions, but before I ask you the last question, the second to last question is your thoughts, experiences, perspectives on why it is that big pharma is so widely accepted and it's okay to go to a doctor and get your, you know, whatever it is, your antidepressant, your anxiety medications, your and, 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 all of those things. Why is that okay? But booking a call with you and <laughs> and having a, you know, ordering whether it's a tincture or an edible or something like that, why you think there is so much negativity towards, towards that experience? Well, I definitely think that we've been conditioned to put our trust into doctors, right? That our doctors are doing us right, looking out for our best interest, they are, after all, a doctor. <laughs> However, we also may or may not know that the pharma, pharma, big pharma, does give incentives, right? And even the medication itself, you see commercials, well, take this for this, but you may get side effects one to a hundred. <laughs> exactly. Did you catch? Did you catch that? Yeah. And sometimes <laughs> I'm like, is this an SNL skit? Because this can't be real. You you have the side effects longer than the whole commercial selling the drug for its symptom. <laughs> yeah. And for people to still think like, oh yeah, I should take that drug, goes back to conditioning. We're so also so busy right? I get that we don't have time to look into everything. So we put our trust into doctors. But I think we're slowly breaking away. That's why there's this whole natural green holistic movement, right? That's been going on. So hopefully, they'll catch on. And I do. And and it's hard. I get it. You want to you want to trust a doctor has the best intentions for you, right? So they prescribe these medications. It takes some getting used to the idea of, well, maybe I should try something natural and holistic plant medicine. And I think the worry is that they don't have anyone to guide them. And even besides me, there are 
naturopath, holistic doctors as well. So definitely start, well, yes, you have to do some digging, right? You have to look into it, which is why also on my website, I have also a page of integrative, natural, holistic doctors to refer that I trust because I understand that it's, it's hard to navigate healthcare in this country. Healthcare is completely broken. We love to shove processed food down your throat and have FDA have inadequate labeling and U.S. only bans like, what, 20 toxins, whereas EU bans like 100 or 1,000. So it's definitely hard to navigate what is healthy for me in this country, down to the very doctor who prescribes you something that has 100 side effects. So there are options out there. It does take a little bit of research and time and effort, but I do believe that plant medicine is definitely, think of it as preventive. You know, I do believe medicine does have its place in the world, but I would love to for myself, practice preventive and healthy lifestyle habits and keep to that until I need that medication from my doctor. What is the worst piece of advice that you've ever gotten? And what's the best piece of advice that you've ever gotten? I would have to say the worst piece is from people outside the industry (laughs) because they don't understand the industry. They're like, oh, well, why don't you advertise? And it's not their fault. They don't understand that because even though CBD is federally legal, because it's still tied to the cannabis plant, that opening a bank account is something you can't do. Regular advertising is something you cannot do. So, so people who are not in my industry, I try not to listen too much. Sure. Yeah. I mean, never ask people for advice who haven't done what you want to do. Exactly. (laughs) Um, And the best advice I got was from someone in my industry and was like, Hey, remember you are a pioneer. This is new. So you get to make, you know, your choices and lay out how it's going to look because this is all new frontier. And that really helped me because I thought like, I must be doing something wrong. And it makes sense once she said that. So that was the best advice ever. Mm, I love that. I love that. That's so good. Well, thank you for sharing your stories, your tips, your tricks, your habits. I will link all of Amy's information in the show notes for everyone listening to check out. And on that note, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for listening to The Cost of the Status Quo and learning the wisdom, stories, and ideas that will have you feeling inspired and ready to take on the world. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to share, rate, and review. It means the world to me and the team putting it all together. If you're looking for more information, you can find us at costofthestatusquo.com or on Instagram at costofthestatusquo. If you've got any questions or curiosity about me, you can find me at lindsaylearner.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-L-E-R-N-E-R.com or on Instagram at lindsaylearner. Thanks again for listening. Hope you have an awesome day.